the um, the uh, oh abstract review committee um, picked them all out, but they did a fantastic job. I yeah. thought the the speakers were all excellent. Yep. And really good information. There was a lot of new stuff that I was learning. So. Yeah, I like the work that's being done in Notre Dame about the fish, and um, yeah, there there was some I thought really good, really good presentations on everything from treatment to uh, toxicology. I mean, it was just a nice mix of uh, speakers, and there was a lot of good interaction afterwards too. So it, I, I thought it was really good. I was hoping that um, Dave got a chance to see the the last session was on safer consumer products from mm -hmm. uh, California. And um, depending on our agendas here in the coming months, it might be something we might want to talk about because I thought it was a really interesting uh, way of looking at PFAS in consumer products. They've got uh, um, work that they're doing on uh, working with the industry to look at alternatives and alternatives analysis to getting PFAS out of carpet. And so that was the first first uh, thing that they've done over there. So they've got a couple of things on the California website. So um, they did a spectacular presentation too. Yeah, I'd really like to see that. Okay. I can probably uh, figure out a way to share that with you too, Dave. Yeah, great. Cause I, like I said, I was out of town, so I wasn't able to able to attend. But uh, um, yeah, I definitely like to see that. I know California seems to be really leading the, you know, as far as PFAS free. They're uh, led between legislation and what they're doing. They really want to try to get rid of all of it. Yeah, they're definitely definitely ahead when it comes to consumer products. They, um, although yep. when we did ask them about their uh, ability to run the program, they do have about forty staff. <laughs> so yeah, that, helps. <laughs> that helps. Yeah, that, that helps. definitely helps. Um, but it is a, a pretty pretty good way of uh, doing that. So I'll I'll have to send that to you. Yeah, big right. yeah. Go one more thing. Also, they're going from forty to seventy or something like that. Uh, in uh, parts for parts per trillion, you mean? Or, no, no, or the analytes? Staff. Oh, staff. yeah. Yeah, yeah. They just got another big chunk from their legislature. They're going to be able to expand their um, safer consumer products program. I think to, right. was it another 30 people? So, yeah, to, up to 70 people. So, yeah. pretty yeah, amazing. It makes a difference. Yeah. I'm sure you'd like to have 70p available people, right, Abby? <laughs> oh, what I could do. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 well, yeah, I'm sure you could. You could do a heck of a lot. <laughs> so, no, we've got got a lot of staff already involved, but um, all right, Sandy, sorry, we're taking up your meeting time. Take, take it away. I'm still on Costa Rica time, so... This is the time I'm expecting my mojito to get here, and it's not here. So, uh, <laughs> so your cabana boy is not showing up. Anytime it's soon it's awful. I don't know what's going on here. Um, all right. So I guess uh, Kelly is Kelly on. Can she do the roll call for us? I sure can. So as a reminder, we're going to do roll call and also. If you happen to have anything to share in your community, that's your time to do that as well. Um, Brad. I'm present. Nothing to share. Okay. Thank you. Charlie. Yes. Can you hear me? I'm here. Thank you. Christina. Connie. Here. Daniel. I'm here. No significant updates this time. Daniel Burlingame. Dave Norwood. Dave Wynn. I'm here. Elizabeth. Gail Mansowitz. Gail Dugan. J. 
Jason sent me an email saying he's not going to be able to attend. Jeffrey Dutton. Jeremy Walsh. Joe. Uh, Joe Kang here. Justin. Ken Harvey. Laura. Leah. Welcome, Lynn Knopf. Oh, thank you very much. Do you like can to you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank thanks. you for joining. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Would you like to share a little bit about yourself? Um, well, sure. I'm. Um, my name is Lynn. I live in Whitehall in Fruitland Township, and um, I've been involved in watershed issues in Fruitland Township for um, a little while. I'm involved with the Duck Lake Watershed Alliance. Um, and uh, I go back to Grand Valley every couple of years and take a class. And so right now I'm taking um, stream ecology, I'm finishing up tomorrow, but I'm um, I'm interested in giving, uh, you know, public presentations on um, current issues and upcoming issues. Um, I've done a little bit with uh, plant diseases, tree diseases that have spread in the area. Um, but I, I'd like to get my my feet wet. I'm really interested in PFAS. It was actually Dr. Radisky who came to my uh, class a couple of years ago and spoke about his involvement in um, with the, the PFAS information group. So that kind of got me interested in this. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Great. Good. Thank you for joining. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Lynn McIntosh. Yes, I am here. Um, nice to meet you, Lynn. Uh, I think Rick's wife is also named Lynn, so I don't know what's going on here. But <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, um, I did have one update. I'm quite in a funk about it, but Wolverine Worldwide announced another delay for their plan for the Rogue River in Rockford. All of a sudden now it might take two more years, which would be a total of three years past their deadline. And uh, as far as we can see, the plan, the reason for the delay is so that they could make the plan not as good and not as effective. Um, and it, uh, it's tough to watch, it's tough to see. So, but we need to keep advocating for the Rogue River and our group will, you know, keep moving forward. But you know, if anyone else is new to this meeting tonight or hasn't been on there, it's very, very interesting how companies wait till December. They often do these things right before Christmas when people are busy, when they're distracted, and there's really not much time to gather your resources together. And they did this consistently for their for the eight years before, uh, uh, before a unilateral order was finally made. Um, for which they had no choice. Um, but other than that, it's it's game. Need to see it, but not giving up. So, and um, I won't share my Christmas list. I'll, I'll email it to you all later. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Thank you uh -huh. for rescuing me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, she got the two Lynns mixed up. And it is mixed up on your sheet there too, Kelly. You've got Lynn, you've got Lynn McIntosh and followed by Lynn Knopf. Maybe you're that's um, how you're doing it, but no, it was me. I messed up. That's okay. You know, <laughs> thank I, you. It's fine. Yeah. All right. I'm off. Margaret. Mary. Mary Blanchard is here. Thank you. And uh, just an update to the uh, Falk Road dump is in the process of getting six new monitoring wells uh, installed just this week. And we heard uh, from Kim Etheridge, the project manager for the dump, that they were allocated, I believe, $216,000 for next year. So we are very appreciative of that. Thank you. Matt? Mike? Pam? Patty? 
Richard Burns. Rick. Here. And I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, there's some new um, information for Harbor Island. That's a site in Grand Haven that's been posted on the Empire website. Um, they have a, the Board of Light and Power has a new consultant and there's a, a new uh, timeline posted and some additional work plans. So uh, people are concerned, interested in Harbor Island. There's, there's some new information posted about it. So. Thank you. Bob Pataki. Mandy. Um, I'm here just. Uh, a quick update in the Belmont area. Wolverine is uh, meeting with us sometime in the next few weeks to talk about the capping of the 30 acre dump site. So uh, they said they've started the permitting process and will be sadly clear cutting the 30 acres of trees and uh, forests there in order to cap it starting in uh, starting in the winter, it sounds like. So I'll keep you posted. Thank you, Sandy. Shalene? I am here and no update. Thank you. Stacy Taylor? Teresa? I'm here and we have an update. Uh, sadly to say, Marathon has uh, proposed increasing their emissions due to a request by Governor Whitmer. And we're not happy with that. Uh, they said that they wanted to increase their emissions due to uh, supply, uh, supply and demand and because gas prices are high and inventory is low. And so we're poisoning ourselves to uh, put up a fight in battle. Thank you. Well, Stacy Taylor wants to try to get my screen, so if she's here. Stacy is here, but she looks like she's unmuted, but I don't see her. Oh, maybe she jumped off to try to jump back on again. We'll give her a minute. Tony, he sent an email saying he wasn't going to be able to attend, as did Bill Barnett. So there we go. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, how many did we have then? How many total? Um, let me sort here real quick. I think we have some things to vote on tonight, so I just want to try and I, I'm not good at math right now, so hopefully it's an even number like 10. Okay, 15. Well, you can, 15. All right. Okay, so let's start with uh, subcommittees. Uh, Dave, do you have anything from the preventative measures subcommittee? Yeah, I do, Sandy. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, as everyone knows, we released the uh, uh, community awareness information document on September the 23rd uh, into the MPART COX and the MPART system. Um, since then, as of December 4th, uh, there are 24 downloads, so it looks like 24 people had downloaded that information, um, which we think I think is pretty darn good. Um, we've got a uh, subcommittee meeting scheduled tomorrow to talk about next steps uh, and also updating the document, uh, how, when, how, and uh, so we have a meeting scheduled for 6 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you. That is pretty good. Good to hear. Yeah. All right. Uh, web review subcommittee. Anything there? Uh, this is Brad Venman. Um, Kelly, were you going to say something first or do I just go ahead? Oh, yes. Um, so as you saw in my email today, Bill Creel, who used to chair the subcommittee, has resigned from the COG. Um, so 
I roped Brad into being the chair of that web committee because he was the only one that participated in the meeting today. So <laughs> thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. You thank bet. you, Brad. Yep, and uh, and as a result, we we do have a fairly small committee. So if anybody is interested in uh, uh, in joining, that would be great. And we're gonna uh, think about some other things that we might want to do to uh, wrap up what we were talking about uh, uh, over the last couple of months as a subcommittee, uh, um, as far as updating things uh, to at least identifying this the type of information for the sites, um, but looking at the possible updates in, in, in the future. Great, thank you. Anyone interested in joining that subcommittee? Please, anyone? If you are interested, you can shoot me an email or Brad an email. All right, thanks Kelly. Um, membership subcommittee. Mary, Daniel, whoever. Um, this is Mary Blanchard. And just to update, we sent yesterday um, the same document we had sent the last two meetings and had moved the discussion points that were at the end of that document up to the top so they might be more recognizable. Um, this is strictly discussion points. We're not voting on this or anything else. We were just uh, hoping to get people's opinions. Um, one of those options were to go back to the governor if, uh, and, and this does not have to do just with notification, but is more of an open concept on any type of things with the COG. Um, if we weren't seeing progress, so I would just like to see if there's anybody who does have comments on that. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, sounds like you have some comments. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I'm wondering when, uh, um, let's see, I'm, I'm looking at the document right now. Number three, it says if sufficient action is not taken in a timely manner. Um, can that be defined more? Well, you know, no. that, that's the thing that we this was just a concept we threw out. Oh, and it, it, it this is not in any way a final document at all. We okay. were just hoping to get feedback and comments. Uh -huh and that just to see if people were interested in this. So, oh. you know, this is this is not at all a final document. It's just a concept. And so it wide open to changes. <laughs> OK, so um, I well, I, I think it's I think it's a good concept. I think it needs to be looked at. We we need to have some ways to uh, keep momentum going and so I, I think it's good and I appreciate the work that the three of you have done on this so far. What, what will you be further discussing? Because, you know, if I was going to say something, I would say, yeah, it'd be good to have you know, kind of specific. Um, well, I think it would depend um, actually on the discussion. It, if members feel that it's something to pursue then that would be fine. We would, you know, be welcome to do it and anybody else could join in as well, either mm -hmm. at the membership uh, subcommittee meetings mm -hmm. um, or, you know, what we could arrange a different time even, so. Yeah, well, I support, I support doing that. I, I think that um, it's, that it, it's not necessarily negative pressure, it, it's positive pressure. We all need deadlines. Um, if it wasn't for a deadline, most things wouldn't get done. <laughs> so uh, I think it need I think it it can very nicely and matter of factly state that you know that this is what we expect. This isn't happening, so we need to we need to take it further. I, I think there's room for that. I support that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Yep. Um, Teresa and then Daniel. Okay, I have a question. In light of um, this document being drafted, have 
there, there any consideration about um, working with the Michigan Public Advocacy Office uh, through public advocate through Jim, uh, Regina Strong? And that office was established to be the conduit to the governor and to the director. And uh, in light of Lethal Clark's departure, uh, the new person that will take her place. Thank you. Right. I, I had considered uh, the departure of Lisa Clark, uh, had not considered regarding the advocacy. So thank you very much, Teresa, with that. Um, thanks, Teresa. I hadn't think, thought of that either. That's a good resource to plug in here as a, another step. Uh, Daniel, and Lynn, you still have your hand up. I don't know if that means you have another question or you just didn't take it down. Um, and Daniel. Yeah, so, you know, Linda the, and Teresa, the questions you both raised, I, th I think are good examples of the kind of feedback that our little membership team is is looking for at this point. Uh, we have, you know, the concept drafted. Uh, we wanted to get feedback from all of you, you know, thinking about, you know, those details that need to be defined at some point, uh, you know, so like that word timely, you know, what does that mean? You know, presumably that could change depending on the specific situation that we find ourselves in and so forth. Uh, but, you know, we can we can say that in a sub point or a footnote somewhere. Um, and then, you know, additional things that, you know, should go in the procedure, like, you know, notifying the, the public advocate, I think makes a lot of sense. That's, that's what she's there for. Um, you know, and then these other considerations, like, you know, if, you know, the, um, you know, ownership of the different roles changes, um, you know, as departments are reorganized or as people uh, switch out and, and elections change over, you know, is this, you know, s sort of future proof? So as long as the cog is here and uh, things are mostly as they are now, uh, you know, is this going to be resilient through sort of, you know, the inevitable political changes over time. I think all that's good to consider and that's that's the kind of stuff we can can work on. Um, but you know that that's the sort of feedback that we need at this point um, with, with the intent of you know eventually getting this into a format where we can you know bring it to a vote for the for the whole group. Thanks. I, I think that's good. I think we do need to have kind of a formal process for what our plan is if we make recommendations that seem to be stalling. So I think this is important work to do. Um, so any other feedback as people look through it, because uh, it's there now, or look through it if you've already saved it on your computer. Um, and I'm assuming if there's no feedback now, they can email it to, to people in the membership committee, uh, Mary and Daniel and anyone else who's in the membership committee, whose name is Joe. Uh, and Joe, that's what I was going to say. Yes, thank you. So um, so then maybe by next month you can have, um, oh, Lynn's got her hand up yet again. Go ahead, Lynn. Just, just really quickly, I'm just wondering, are you guys wanting more feedback and discussion at this point for the go ahead? I just, you know, um, We've had minimal I, discussion, and I'm just wondering what you were hoping for, Mary and Joe and um, Dan. Is this enough to get get you to move to the next step, or if, you know, that's all I'm asking, Sandy. Right. Um, I, I guess uh, Daniel and Joe and I will have to meet, and if anybody uh, has any more comments or suggestions, we'd be open to seeing them. Before that, thank you. All right, so send them your suggestions so they can finish this part up. Um, thank you. Anything else on membership, Mary, that you have to do besides this? Uh, we have, we've been concentrating on this, so we have not really pursued anything else. All right. Um, after the first of the year, I might try contacting some of the communities uh, that are not represented and just maybe try to reach out to their town halls or that and just see if they know of citizens that are involved and maybe go from there. Sounds good. All right. 
Um, thank you. And on to the engaging the public subcommittee. So Rick, I'll let you take it away from here. Yeah, um, are we going to jump right into discussing this memo or um, I just want a general update? However you would like it to go. Well, I think the, the discussion of the memo is later on in the agenda, but um, I, I did want to give a, um, just a, an update on the, we, I had a meeting, uh, Andy Graham was kind enough to set up a meeting with the Michigan Association of Townships, and they actually have a PFAS committee, so the, all the townships, uh, PFAS is on their radar, and there is a, uh, at least, you know, on, on the first uh, cuff, there's uh, interest in helping support uh, EGLE in their uh, notification process. So townships have uh, access to tax records, which have people's names and addresses and who's living there, and uh, they can do the one mile radius uh, calculation for us. So I think they're uh, on board to uh, see if there's a, uh, a way they can work more closely with Eagle to provide the notification, which I think is a good step. That's great to know. I, who knew that? Did, did Rick leave? Did Rick flouts out after that? Yeah, I'm having some audio problems here, so we'll okay. see. All right. Are you there, Rick? At least by. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm having some audio problems, so I, I. It keeps cutting in and out, so I. I don't know what's the matter with my internet connection. Okay. Uh, do you want to take the next one, or? Are we moving right to doing the? Um, the document? Yeah, it looks like we have to vote on a notification document and a discussion of surface water contamination notification. Okay. Well, I'll uh, move on. Uh, I'll start it. And if, if I cut out or something, you know, we'll have to, <laughs> I don't know what we'll have to do. But um, anyway, um, we have uh, a document that was circulated, which is our recommendation for public notification. And we also have received some uh, some comments from Tony that uh, he wants to reject the uh, the document. Um, I really don't want to interpret his uh, his comments, but um, he uh, is concerned about the fact that there's some uh, information. If you want to scroll down a little further. Um, where it says the two week notice. Yeah, where it's, it's kind of cut off there, but anyway, um, we're, we're talking about a uh, providing notification uh, if there is uh, analytical data or if there is a high likelihood of, of uh, a current or historical release. So his concern was how this applies to the Traverse City Cherry County Airport, and he felt his comment was that if he read this, Eagle could would do nothing. And <laughs> I disagree with that comment. Unfortunately, he's not here, so I, I don't know what to do about that. I, I think uh, we tried to be really specific in terms of uh, when the notification occurs, and analytical data is certainly important, but we also discussed several scenarios where uh, like where there's been a triple F foam. Um, if there's a, uh, a, a release of the firefighting foam uh, at an airport or something that uh, is documented, then that would constitute, um, you know, a, a release. We don't necessarily have to have analytical data. And I don't know enough about the Traverse City Airport site. But uh, I read the uh, the notification that Eagle sent out to them, and it talked about uh, talked about the potential for um, 
storage uh -huh. of, of the foam in, in a hangar and things like that. So I, I think under that case, uh, Eagle should have, if, if they're following this you know, notification process, um, there was sufficient information for them to uh, do the notification. Now that's obviously you know several years ago, so we can't we can't go back. But uh, I I don't I don't think that uh, um, the fact that we're, we're talking about a, a a historical release, there is documentation that uh, would show that if you use the firefighting foam or if there was a release of plating waste. Um, and they were treating the groundwater for hexavalent chromium. There's scenarios where you don't have to have the data and you can act on a uh, notification or a uh, suspicion of a release. Uh, so I don't necessarily agree with his comments. Um, um, so that's my response. Dave, when did he give you, I think Tony had emailed me and said he gave you his proxy vote. Is that the case, yeah, Dave? Yes, yes he did. And, and uh, I guess the question that I have, and I've talked to Tony and I read his email, I think Tony's biggest concern right now is that the some verbiage has been changed in this memorandum um, that basically says that it's predicated on necessary resources, okay? And if the resources aren't available, then what happens? So I don't think it's just a, a matter of, of you know, the the notification of the two weeks, it says Eagle and, M, Eagle and MDHHS will allocate the necessary resources and provide uh, within one mile radius. Well, what if the resources aren't available? Then what happens? Well, I, I certainly can address that. And I, I put that in there specifically because um, MPART doesn't have resources. Um, so we have to rely on uh, Eagle and MDHHS, and we've had a number of discussions about MDHHS doing notifications, and you know the, the common is that resources aren't there. So I'm proposing, or I'm saying that, that they should allocate those resources. So um, we, well, can we, we can take that out. We can take that out. I wanted to make sure that uh, that the committee is aware that those resources don't necessarily exist right now, but if the if the committee feels that uh, you know we we should strike that, I have no no problem with with doing that. But the issue is is if there's no notif if there's no resources, then there's no notifications that are sent out. So that's not what it says. It says it should allocate the necessary resources. It doesn't say it only has to do it if there's necessary, if there's resources. Okay, that's not the one, okay. Unless this is a different document, Rick. No, this is, the, that, that that's true. I, you know, I, I, I was trying to acknowledge that uh, there needs to be resources available for, for doing this. And I didn't, I'm not saying. Kelly, can you go to the part that we're talking about? You keep moving it. Man, I'm, I'm drunk right now, it feels like. <laughs> I'm trying I'm to not find really, it, Sandy. But I, yeah, I'm right there. Oh. I think it's further down. I think it's the next page. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Well, 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 right there. Yeah. It says Eagle MDHHS should allocate the necessary resources to provide notification of potentially affected private well owners located within a one mile radius when analytical data becomes available of PFAS groundwater contamination, blah, 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 or if Eagle becomes aware of a historical or current release of PFAS. So it's it's not an either or scenario. It's it's just we're saying that they they should allocate the resources and do this. Um, Teresa, do you have something to add to this? 
Yes, uh, I'm just concerned about the language when it says when data becomes available. What does that mean to, to me? They, the, the data, I'm thinking that. Well, I, I think there, there there's two scenarios about available data and one of the, one of the scenarios is that Eagle is doing an investigation and you know they're generating data. The other one that's uh, come up recently is that uh, Eagle could be given data by a third party that's doing a baseline environmental assessment. So that's what happened with the Eagle <clears throat> Ottawa site in Nuevo County, and they were given uh, the B the B B E A information about uh, PFAS being there. So. Um, I'm just saying that whenever Eagle gets data that shows there's contamination above the uh, drinking water standard, that would trigger uh, public notification that drinking wells, you know, within a one mile radius should be notified. Well, then to me, that brings up timeline, right? Because what if the data becomes available, uh, say, a month after an incident or, or a discovery? So timeline to me comes into play. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, right now, aren't they asking for input on budget so that uh, we could probably put some um, budget uh, uh, allocation into that now so there would be money there? Because uh, we were asked uh, for our priorities on the um, Mac EJ and how much do we want to go to this and that. So I think we should be looking at uh, the budget uh, uh, commissions of uh, allocation for monies around notification. Thank you. Well, Thanks, I was trying Rick. to not. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Go ahead, Sandy. Well, I was just going to say, Rick, if you want to go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I was trying to make it not a, a budget issue. Um, you know, if. if if Eagle has different programs where they're, um, like for example, they have a program to look at wastewater treatment systems. And if uh, in the process of looking at a wastewater treatment system, they request data from the wastewater treatment system to sample their wells for PFAS. And if that data comes back positive, then that would trigger a, a notification if there are public drinking water wells down gradient from the wastewater system. So. Uh, or in the area of the wastewater system. So um, I, I, I'm not looking at a, you know, a budget scenario um, and, and the timeline occurs when, once that data is available. So once there is data and it's been, you know, properly QC'd and, and whatnot, that there's two weeks then that the public should be notified that if you're down gradient from that wastewater system and the wastewater system has wells that are above the drinking water standard that uh, the notification should go out. Yeah. Or, as, or as in the case of the uh, Eagle Ottawa, when they got uh, the information sent to them by the third party doing the baseline environmental assessment, uh, the notification should go out uh, within two weeks. And what's interesting about that situation was the uh, person that purchased the property got that notice and he immediately put in a treatment system for the animals that were drinking the water from from wells on the site but then it took 30 days before people were notified after the data came in and we're trying to get that 30 days down to two weeks because i think it's very important for a variety of health reasons uh, you know, for immunity for children and for uh, pregnant women and the fetus. Uh, if that information is available, people need to know that. So that's why we're pushing the two weeks. Who goes to a job? Don't anybody come to your house and then. Yeah, but I mean, she was here a long time, a NASA. Teresa, are you? Oh, I think she may have been talking to someone else. Um, Teresa or Connie? I think you're next and then yeah. like, Kelly, can you bring it down just a little bit so we can see where it says two? I mean, go up, go up. I'm sorry, go up. OK, right there where it says two. bring it up just a little bit more so we can see it Up uh, where it says number two, Kelly. Yeah, right there. there. What constitutes initial notice? I would suggest 
that we just take out the reference when we look at, let's see what sentence, I think it's a second sentence in number two. Eagle DHSS should allocate the necessary resources. Delete should allocate the necessary resources to provide. Just say that Eagle needs to provide notification. We, we don't have a right to tell Eagle, uh, hey, you should allocate resources to this or that. We should just simply say, Eagle, provide notification. Forget the whole part about necessary resources. That's speculative. That's my yeah, comment. I'm, I'm fine with that change. I, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, they currently do not have the resources. At least that's what I'm being told. So uh, we, we can just strike that and, and say they should do this. That, that's, that's, that's fine. The emphasis should be on them notifying and yeah. the necessary resources. That's a side issue and it doesn't involve us. All right, uh, Lynn. That, that's right where I was as well. Um, I don't know if it's in part of this document, but maybe it's in tonight's discussion later, but if you know, let's, you know, if Rick is saying that they don't have the resources, then either through this or through some other document, we need to say if Eagle doesn't have the resources, they need them. And that, that the, the matter needs to be expedited to the Department of Eagle and to the governor. That and to the, I mean, citizens need to know Eagle doesn't have money or staff to do these important programs. But it's got to get attention. I understand. I, I am very uh, sympathetic to the fact how hard it is to work without not having the resources and staff you need. That's why I think we need to advocate for that. I don't. I know it's a side path in a certain way, but it's not in another. I understand why Tony would be concerned about anything that would give a reason for delay. That's it. So whether you put it here or somewhere else, I think we need to be strong about that. That's my, that's my thought. Thank you, Lynn. Good comments. Uh, what I was going to comment was um, simply that I wanted to make sure Teresa saw in there that it was both if there's data available that Eagle contacts people to for notification, but also if there is a historical reason to believe that is leading them to investigate like an airport, a military base, all of those places that we know tend to be there that we also expect that. So we have both. I think the first concern people uh, I had when I read it was waiting for the data to be there because that was one of the concerns at Traverse City and I don't want to see that repeated. So that was my comment. It's weird to call it myself. Okay, Charlie. Yeah, Sandy, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, I wanted to support what uh, Connie said as far as rewording to uh, strike the reference to necessary resources. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Mary. I would also like to support Lynn's theory that we need to uh, be stronger. Um, whether we do it as a cog or individually, that we need to start uh, working with the new legislature coming in to uh, assign necessary resources to MPART and to EGLE for proper staffing and activities to be able to carry out their job carefully. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mary. I'm going to add that to the agenda. Uh, probably for next month, unless we have like tons of time today so that we can talk about strategy on how we want to do that, because I've heard that from several people now. So, um, all right, um, Connie, I think you're next. Charlie and Mary, you still have your hands up, so I'll just yeah. wave back to you. Just real quick, perhaps the idea was raised at Rick's um, subcommittee meeting this afternoon at five o'clock 
that maybe we need to have a legislative funding kind of subcommittee or something like that to get the resources for EGLE. One other key point you should always recognize is you really should be nice to the people in Wayne County because we control a third of the state legislature. And when we start working our legislators, we can get things passed. That's it. Thank you, Connie. That's always good advice to have. All right. Um, Dave, I'm kicking it back to you because you've kind of been thrown in uh, as Tony's proxy and I know he had a lot of concerns. So I'm wondering if you think this answered his concerns or I'm if we strike out the necessary resources. I'm going to say no. I, I think that we need to I mean, is this something that we need to vote on this month, this COG, or do we get the changes made and then present a final document? What do y'all think? Well, um, we we have both options. Um, if there's, you know, if there's minor changes, I, I think we can vote on it as is. If there's major changes, then you know it needs to go back. And I. I think the the other the overarching issue was Tony's comment about uh, the fact that the prior memo was revised, and he felt that there should be a we should keep the prior memo as is, and then have a notification doc a separate notification document. Um, that that to me is is the biggest issue, and I. Uh, I feel one of the reasons why there's been no action um, on the first memo is that we it's been uh, the way it was put together. There was some very strong language in there, and I don't think that what we were asking for in that memo is is uh, achievable um, or, or can be done in a reasonable manner. And I will address. Uh, you know, specifically what I'm talking about um, was under the uh, policy and guiding principles of the previous uh, memo, where it says we should fully notify any and all potentially impacted individuals as soon as the state has information to start an investigation. Um, fully notify, I don't know what that means. Um, and I, I don't think any and all potentially impacted individuals applies to uh, when we're looking at a watershed wide contamination event like we had in the Huron River. Um, I, I don't know how you're going to go out and do that. The one part that uh, really concerned me was that um, it says potentially impacted individuals have the right to know immediately all of the relative information relevant information about risks and of the possible PFAS exposure. And I don't know how we provide immediate notification to any and all potentially exposed residents. So I, I think we need to massage some of that language. And I tried to make it very direct in terms of, uh, you know, we should provide notification. Uh, I didn't put the immediate in there. It's the, the, the two weeks notice. So, I think the, the the question really is that do we want to take the old document and revise it and keep revising it in terms of uh, getting it closer and closer to perfection, or do, do we want to have that old document sitting out there and then have the supplementary documents that disagree with what's in that document? Because clearly a two weeks notice disagrees with immediate notification. So I don't think we can have both documents. That's my concern. Uh, Lynn. Um, I think we need to move forward. I think that's one reason we have a voting system. Um, it, we, it's 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 going to move things forward. Need to make some progress. I mean, documents need to be adapted. I'm not in support of two different documents. Um, I I think we all want to move forward. I think some part wants to as well. Um, 
so we need to work on getting the resources and all that but to slow things down and wait till january and then go into february again it's like you know there's the understanding that small changes could be made but i think i i support voting tonight and moving forward that's my opinion all right connie yeah, Rick, do you think you could work it out with Tony? I would hate to see alienation take place in in this group. And, and even things like immediate, we could define like lawyers do. Immediate means two weeks or less. I mean, we can do that kind of thing. And it would really be great if you and Tony could work it out. That's my feeling, even if it means voting at the next meeting. I will comment directly on that, Connie, and I put this information out and Tony chose to wait till the last minute last night to respond and, you know, torpedo the whole thing. So I don't know if I can work something out with him. You know, I, I think I put this, uh, we put this memo together and, you know, he, he's interpreting things that I, I don't see that are there. And, you know, I perhaps I can have that conversation with him, but you know, I, I don't know. I think we should have a group discussion rather than me trying to work it out with Tony, so. Um, Charlie, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. I just wanted to offer uh, forth a suggestion that, um, you know, the uh, different versions could be put on the uh, MPART website and uh, those that are have been superseded and are no longer in effect could be marked as such and indicated as such and that uh you know i support voting on it tonight with the idea that that this document will be um, revised periodically going forward to improve it kind of a continuous improvement model for lack of a better word and um i mean that's how all regulations and procedures and legislation that's how it works Thank you. Yeah, and I, I fully support that because I, I call this version 2.0. So, um, and we could have 2.1, 2.2, and then 3.0 with surface water. But I, I think we need to keep revising this and, and trying to get something that, that can be implementable. And, um, you know, I, I think if we, if we try and have a separate notification document, then we're going to have to address what fully notified means and, you know, the immediate, um, immediate to me means next day. And what you're saying in a legal sense, it means two weeks. And I, I don't think people on the committee, you know, would know that. And I think we need to, to speak in common terms, not, you know, overly scientific terms, which I try and, and avoid and not, you know, legalese. Because like any and all, potentially exposed people that's you know that sounds legalese to me i think we should just say notify people rather than you know any and all fully and things like that so um, I'm, I'm trying to get away from things that can be sticking points and just have a straight you know we need to notify people so um dave i see you got your hand up <clears throat> yeah the only sandy the only thing the only comment i want to make is that I think sitting here, I've heard some conversations uh, about voting on it tonight. I've also seen, I've heard uh, some conversations about some changes uh, people you know, are suggesting to be made. Um, personally, myself, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't approve a document that needed changes um, until, we, until it's completely changed. I mean, I, we, could, we could change this thing until the cows come home you know, and have addendums to addendums to addendums, but um, having a base document that we all agree on and that, you know, we, we need to approve. I mean, I think we've, I've heard there's changes that subtle changes or minor changes that need to be made. So again, we're gonna vote on a document that needs minor changes. Um, I don't understand why we can't make those changes. Everybody agrees. And then we vote on it next month and get it over with. I, I, I don't. I know the expediency of getting it taken care of, but um, personally, myself, um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't approve. Um, I wouldn't approve a document 
that it needs to be changed. That's just okay. my personal opinion. That's good feedback. Kelly. I was going back and forth on this if we're voting, if we're not voting, and I've been trying to look for Connie Boris's um, guidelines for how we come up with if we're voting or not. Oh, good grief. We'd have to ask Connie that. <laughs> and and I, me. I believe somebody, and don't quote me because I can't find it for sure, but I think if somebody puts it forward that it's voting, and you have somebody agree that there's going to be a vote, then there's a vote. So um, can I just offer this up as just a thought, though? I think what Dave brought up was that we've got some corrections that need to be ma made, albeit minor. There's some disagreements with people that aren't able to make it tonight about some things. Would it be prudent for us to make the final um, changes that were discussed tonight Add those pieces in, um, let everybody review it, and then do a vote next month is, is just a thought. Um, so I, I've got so many hands up of people that I don't know if you were still up, so I'm going to start from the top. Lynn, what's your comment? Yes, my, my comment is one reason we have the voting procedures is to move ahead on things. Um, I do have some history here. It was at the very last minute on the first public notification document, I do, re I do recall that Tony weighed in and everything got lagged again, and that's when I decided to join the committee. Um, and we did get a unanimous vote, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that, as Rick was saying, was even workable because, you know, it couldn't be implemented. So the thing is, we don't have to have unanimous vote. And I think it can be worked out. But I, I think that at the, at the, you know, the 11th hour to come in and, and to stall progress, I don't think that's prudent. And I don't, I don't think that we're, this is just something to get us moving forward and it's so close. So I don't, I don't think what Connie suggested about Rick being the one to work out with Tony makes any sense at all. I'm sorry, Connie. I, I like you very much and you have a lot of good ideas, but that's not Rick's role. We are a group. And I, I just think we need to understand it may not always be unanimous. Okay, that's my thought. But I'm one person, so I will stop now. Okay, Dave, is your hand up again? No. Oh, okay. Um, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. My hand uh, is up uh, for a reason. I wanted to uh, comment. Um, we're a group of uh, 33 in the meeting tonight, not all voting members, of course. We have the document open in front of us in a word processor. And while I'm uh, sensitive to what Dave said, you know, uh, if a group like this is going to get business done uh, entirely remotely by Teams and Zoom, and we have a document open in a word processor, I would suggest that when we come up with edits that people generally agree on, um, that uh, whoever's in charge of the word processor edit the document, strike out the language, put in the new language, for example, the striking of, uh, you know, allocating necessary resources and simply providing notification. It's on the screen in front of everybody. And we don't have to put it off for a month. Sometimes it ends up being two months with you know, holiday delays and some are this and some are that. Um, and, and, that and we can move forward and start to get things done. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Mary. I'm torn on this, but I actually support Sandy's idea about making the proper changes and putting it off for one month so that those people who are not in attendance will be able to see the final document. Thank you. All right, and Connie. I agree with both Sandy and Mary. I think our credibility might be a little at issue if we don't do it right. What is 30 days? It's only 30 days, so let's delay it for 30 days and do it the right way. So I support Sandy's suggestion. 
that's it. Any other comments or voices of reason that want to please chime in? Please, someone. Oh. This is Shalene, and I, I'm on my phone, and I have no idea how to raise my hand. You did um, it perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I apologize. Um, so I've been listening to go this to go back and forth, and and I'm the comment that was made about um, businesses trying to shove things through before Christmas time is resonating with me, um, and also this issue of um, bringing something forward for a vote when we know it's not the way we want it to be, um, and having comments come in last minute that kind of upset the apple cart. This happens all the time in government. Um, you know, we get public comments, we get, um, you know, people on our boards that come to the meetings where we're supposed to vote and, and they decide that they want something changed and it upsets the apple cart. But this is this is part of the process. Um, if we knowingly know that this document's not the way we want it to be, then we, we really shouldn't be voting on it. Um, but if we want to pursue voting on it, then we should just go ahead and vote on it let it get turned down, refer it back to the committee, and have it fixed. Period. So that that's my comment. This is not uncommon. Like this this is not frustrating to me at all because I, I live this every day. All right. Thank you. And I feel bad for you that you live this every day. Um Daniel. Yeah, I, I think Shelly said it well. Um yeah, I get everybody's frustration with this, but I, I agree that it it makes sense to um, you know take a beat, make sure that we have uh, have it as we want it to present to the group and give give everybody a, abundant notice so that you know there can't be any uh, detraction later saying you know there wasn't enough time. You know, to, to Connie's point that you know I think it's it's better to get it right. And, Take another beat. So, thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm going to suggest then that it sounds like uh, it may be prudent for us to uh, make the changes, albeit the small changes, send it back for everyone to please review. I'd suggest that we have a due date of like January fifth or something. So these are no longer end of the, you know, 24 hour notice of I don't like this. Um, and then plan on voting at this at the January meeting if that sounds uh, OK to do. I think I would also suggest then that whatever the first document is that's got uh, people concerned that somehow we get both of those documents together so people can review. It sounds like what this is, is this is the second iteration of that first document that's actually just got more clarifying information to it rather than kind of these blanket global statements. We're just drilling down. It sounds like the work work's done in that committee is drilling down to make sure things are actually clearer and less kind of pie in the sky. So um, that's going to be my suggestion unless someone wants to move for this to go forward for a vote. Yeah, this is Joe, and I like your 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 uh, approach, and I'll support that. All right, thank you, Joe. Rick, Rick had his hand up. Yeah, I I just want to make clear that the only issue that I need to change is is remove the uh, allocation of resources. That's the only one that I've had concrete, you know, that I, I have a concrete idea on what to change. I, I don't know if there's other minor changes or I, I, I'm a little uh, perplexed on what to do. You know, it, it sounds simple, but, you know, I, I can easily strike that language and, and turn this around tomorrow morning. That was the only change that I heard people saying was those yeah. four words allocation of resources yeah. well I, I will make yeah i will make the change uh and send it out tomorrow morning so uh 
Connie, you had a comment? Connie? Connie Boris. Or, uh, sorry, Sandy, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, I think this gives people who didn't have the opportunity to read this. Uh, I still say we vote on it though next month, like January 5, or I mean, at least have that. Let other people give comments, those who didn't have the opportunity maybe to read it thoroughly and have both documents side by side. All right. Thank you, Connie. So let me ask one more clarification. I, I sent the track change version out. Um, Tony requested that, and I sent it out the next day after his request. And then I didn't hear from him, you know, for, for three weeks until, you know, Friday night. But uh, or yesterday night. But uh, anyway, um, is the change document? Do I need to track change that, or what? What format do you want both documents for me to to, to return to you? To you. Lynn, you're on mute, dear. Yeah, sorry. Um I do very much appreciate. I'm always one for high quality on things that I do and high standards, and I get that. But I think at the next CAG meeting on the agenda, we ought to be understood that Rick did what was suggested last time by, by Tony and others. He made he sent a tracked document well before this meeting today, well before. So there ought to be some kind of thing in line out of consideration for us moving forward that there's a respect and that it's not at the last minute because it will be two years now in in February about the whole Sabbath City thing. And um, I'm disappointed. I, I understand the idea of wanting to do a quality job. But I got to balance that by how do we do this so that if you don't make a comment in time, the whole thing doesn't fall either. So it's ready to go to February. I I don't feel optimistic that we'll seal the deal in January, and that it hangs. And I don't know. That's just and and I'm a different kind of a person. But I get the I get it all. It's not fair to the committee to come in at the last minute. I I, I disagree with that. So. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Connie, do you have a suggestion to Rick on what yeah. kind of document you Track want this changes. on? Track changes, Rick. That's really illuminating. Illuminating. <laughs> okay. Do, do that. I like that a lot better. Thanks. All right. Okay. So you will you will get you will get the document with track changes, and it will everybody has to realize that those changes will have to be accepted before we vote on it. Because you know it, it's it's not going to be the complete document until those changes are accepted, and then I will also provide the, the same track changes document of the original one, so you can see what's been changed. Thank you, Rick. I would okay. also ask that all feedback come in by January fifth, so we don't have this twenty fifth hour objection that gives us no time to fix things. So. Um, Lynn, your hand is still up. I'm going to assume you just forgot to put it down. Mary and then Charlie, and then we've beaten this horse to death. Sorry, I um, I just want to clarify with Rick when he just said the track change is going to be the final document. Could we possibly, like, if you set the deadline for January 5th, that that document could then be made into a final document and then presented? so that we know that that is the actual voting document and we can vote in January. Would that be possible? Thank you. Well, well let, let me do another option. <laughs> I, I, I think I can send out three versions. One, the final version, one that shows the track changes, and then one that shows the track changes from the original document. So you'll have all three of them. I will label them as such and if there are additional changes that come in, um, I, I can either make those or we can discuss them again. I, I, I don't know if, if, if we get a, you know, 
if there's something more than the resources, then we're, we're, we're kind of obligating ourselves to getting back together and discussing it. So, 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 so. Okay. I, um, Charlie, were you on or did you drop off? I don't know who's on the phone, but I think you have to mute or something. Okay. Um, I think we have done that. So thank you, Rick, for all your work on this. You really have done a lot of work. I think we can talk about how to turn this around quicker so that we don't run into this in the future. I think this is just part of having committees that work by Zoom. Um, so we'll, we'll get this going here. Okay, so I think subcommittees are now done, I think. All right, Abby, I think you're up next. Okay, take a break, Sandy, take a break. Um, all right, one of the things that came up um, in last month's meeting was a little bit more information to the group about Eagle and kind of, you know, the divisions, who does what, um, and we, it's Kelly did send out some information. So if you haven't seen or looked at the email from Kelly, please grab it and look it up. There was a couple of different documents. Thank you, Kelly, that she sent over that you guys will want to keep for handy reference. Um, this one is that she's got up right now is being um, updated, uh, but it is a great overview of all of the different pieces and parts of Eagle. Um, as you know, we've got nine different district offices. Um, actually, it looks like we're up to 10 now. A whole bunch of different offices, um, Climate and Energy, Office of Great Lakes, Office of uh, Environmental Justice and Public Advocate, um, number of divisions, and um, we'll go through the, the roster on how many people we have, but a lot of different programs. So please take a look at that. I think it'll I think it'll be interesting and useful for you. Um, staff numbers, as we've said in the past, um, MPART is a coordination and collaboration body. We, we, our job is to collaborate and coordinate all of the different PFAS activities, but we don't necessarily direct staff. So the staff that are working on PFAS projects um, we have a few in air quality that do some air quality stuff, but that's hasn't been a huge um, piece yet. Drinking water, environmental health, absolutely. That's where the that's where the drinking water program for all the municipal water systems sits. Um, our environmental investigation section is our um, environmental conservation officers. So we work with DNR, but we actually have environmental conservation officers who do investigations for us, criminal investigations. Um, they go out when um, <laughs> when we have to knock on doors that are a little sketchy and we need to get some information. So uh, we bring the ECOs, as we call them, out to help us out with those things. Um, environmental support, that is the um, division that helps put on our conferences, does all of our online um, trainings. They, they do a ton of brochures and that kind of stuff, uh, just a huge amount of support. Executive section, obviously our finance division does all our grants and loads program. Information management is a new division. Why the, That's why there's only 18 people, but they are um, helping to stand up a lot of our GIS platforms, um, kind of getting us centralized with some of our uh, database systems. Um, materials management used to be our, our, what was our waste management division, um, but they are now materials managed because they don't do just waste management. They also do all of our recycling programs, our um, scrap tire programs. They've got a lot of different um, programs under uh, what we call MMD. Oil, gas, and minerals obviously is um, just what it says. So it's a little bit smaller division, but still very, very active in the uh, types of work that they do. Remediation and redevelopment division is going to have the bulk of the PFAS work. Um, they're going to, between 
RRD and Water Resources Division, those two divisions are going to be the bulk of the project managers you might work with um, who might do PFAS work. So um, RRD usually gets those sites that are abandoned, orphaned, or are going through property transactions. That's how we would get a lot of that kind of information. Water Resources is going to be more on the permitting side. They will get the facilities that need a stormwater permit or a um, NPDES permit or, you know, uh, some other kinds of wastewater treatment plant type of things. You will have um, a lot of different people working in those sections. So that's where we are as of today. Um, and so let's go on to the next slide, Kelly. One thing that I wanted to add on here, um, COG leadership asked to see these EAGLE numbers. Um, they also wanted the breakdown per district office. We don't have that, but I did hyperlink the EGLE organizational charts right here where you can access all of the different division organizational charts so you can see what office they're in. Mm -hmm. Some of the programs are run centrally and some of them have represent you know, um, uh, project managers in the districts. So, um, but it's just going to depend on how the program is run. Um, so this is a, a just kind of a general overview of some of the policy and procedures. We have 144 different policy and procedures plus regulatory obligations plus statutory deadlines. That's not all listed in here. Um, but I believe, Kelly, you got these all off our website. So, you know, Obviously, if you are really, really um, going to dive deep into this stuff, you can always dig into our website and look at the types of different uh, things that are out there. Yep, there's a hyperlink right there for you. Kelly is on it for you. Make it super easy. Yeah, um, so just clarification, this isn't on MPART's website. This is Eagle's website. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, and then we found this graphic that I thought was kind of interesting because um, I know last month we talked a lot about Falk Road and there's a myriad of issues out there as, as Mary knows um, and Stacy knows. There's a whole bunch of different issues that are all kind of coalescing in this one particular project. And so um, this is a great just a diagram of the different types of um, regulations that we have just in the in uh, water resources division. So this is all of water resources, different types of programs. There are sections of law that would protect wetlands or there are sections of law that will uh, be for soil erosion and sedimentation control for construction work, um, wastewater discharges. If you're going to get floodplain work, you got to get a permit, um, you know, dam safety section, they've got groundwater quality rules. There's a lot of different pieces. So you may be dealing with a particular site and may have to deal with program staff from, you know, five different sections and think that one person should be able to answer it all when um, sometimes that's not always the case. So um, there are people who deal with just one or two permits and they may not be as um, have the, the broad knowledge that you may need on a project. So um for mpart hopefully you guys have all seen this slide um because this is this is what mpart looks like in a in an organizational structure so um i coordinate with seven different departments at the state level to make sure that all of those agencies are collaborating on pvas issues um we also collaborate let's go back to that for a second um kelly we also collaborate. Uh, can you go back one or no? Thanks. Um, we collaborate. We talk directly with the governor's office. Um, we also have the science advisory group, a local health department advisory council that we work with. Um, obviously, you guys are right there with the citizens advisory work group, and then. Um, uh, Kelly is um, Kelly and Amy are there under operations manager, and then we've got a technical advisory work group that's internal to the departments within um, within the various agencies. Okay, now you can go to the next one real quick. Oops, wrong way. There we go. So just so you know, kind of like Rick was saying earlier, um, at the structural level. 
I have no direct reports. I have no staff. Um, Kelly and Amy reside within uh, the RRD, within the Remediation Redevelopment Division, along with Mike Jury. So the three of them do MPART work full time, but they they don't actually report to me. Um, so between the four of us, we're the only ones working on PFAS full time for MPART. Um, but we also have um, within uh, water resources division, we have an emerging pollutant section that works on PFAS stuff right now because it's really the only emerging pollutant sec uh, uh, program that they're working on, but uh, they've been dedicating 12 staff to PFAS work for MPDS permits, wastewater treatment plants, um, uh, a variety of di different issues that they're working on, um, working through groundwater discharges that they're looking at. So they are. They also have people that are working within that division. RRD has staff that also work on PFAS, but they're not dedicated just to PFAS. So um, that's why you see down at the bottom on the left hand side, it says 300 staff that PFAS work is part of their job. So that 300 staff are going to be within within Eagle, within DHHS, within MDARD, within uh, DNR that work on PFAS in some shape or form, but it's not their whole job. Um, so right now, Kelly and Amy are working with 87 different site leads um, just for the MPART sites that we have, not including all the people who do PFAS work that aren't site leads. So, um, so just to give you an idea, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a orchestra director, so to speak. Um, I don't get to drive the bus and I don't always get to uh, pull the curtains, but I'm there to help coordinate the, the orchestra. So um, this is my org chart. Um, and as you guys heard, uh, Director Clark will be leaving as of January 1st, and so uh, we'll be getting in a new director. That new person will be my boss, so looking forward to, to meeting him at that point. Um, and then under RRD, um, you can see here Amy it, Peterson is a, a unit manager with Kelly and Mike and a student that we're soon to be hiring um, off uh, reporting to the division director, uh, Mike Neller over in RRD. So that's kind of the way it looks. I don't know if that helps clarify things. There's a lot of a lot of people who touch PFAS in, in one shape or form. Um, and it's a lot to make sure that everybody's all rowing in the right direction. So do we have one more slide or is that the last of them for that one? OK, yeah, why don't we take questions first before I move on? Go ahead, Teresa. Um, did I see Marianne Dolahente's name on there? How far she retired? Marianne will be retiring at the end of December. Okay. All right, thank you for that clarification. Yep, yep, yep. So you've met Annette Switzer. She'll be taking over. Okay, go ahead, Connie. Uh, yeah, quick question. Leslie Clark, why is she leaving and who is the person who's taking that position? Um, the governor uh, announced that there'd be a shift in leadership. I don't have any other details other than that. Um, the current director of DNR, Dan uh, Eichinger, Eichinger, I'm not sure that I'm actually saying his name correctly, um, will be taking over. And so it's an acting position. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what that means, but uh, I'll, we'll get to meet him shortly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on any of that? Okay. Um, so I hope you guys got to take uh, and listen in to the um, Great Lakes PFAS uh, Summit. I thought we did really, really well. We had, we were 20 participants short of 2000. So I was very, very pleased with that. 
um, had representation from almost the entire United States um, and 12 countries. So that's pretty amazing for our little virtual uh, conference. So it was it was very good. The com it was very technical. I know a lot of people said, whoo, that was they needed to slow down a little bit, um, but it was um, really good information in some of what I thought was really some leading science out there um, coming in from our, our uh, uh, speakers. So I thought we did a really good job on that, got some really good feedback. Um, and, you know, while we didn't get, you know, the the um, groundbreaking news that I was hoping from EPA, uh, we did get them to actually come and talk to us about the PFAS roadmap. So go ahead, Sandy. Um, I was just wondering, are any sessions recorded or available or the, if people um, wanted to access them, is there a way to? If you if you signed up and hopefully everybody here signed up because we did uh, provide That's a free fine. we provided a free link for everybody who was a COG member. So or a, a way to you know get into the conference for free. So if you if you signed up but we're gone, they're all recorded on the Wahoova app. And so you've got three months to go back and listen to any of them. So as long as you signed up, um, even if you didn't get to go, uh, they are all still there in that Wahoova app and you can uh, take advantage of those. Great. All right. Thanks. Yep. So, all right. Um, I'm hoping and I guess I haven't talked about this with uh, with the leadership team yet, but I'm um, hoping to uh, bring uh, Kristen Ward from our Department of Health and Human Services uh, to come in and talk more about uh, the drinking water campaign, statewide education campaign. Um, one of the things you know that's become very obvious to us is that if we really want to notify residents that we need just we need to notify the whole state. Um, I don't know that there is a one mile radius in the state that may not be affected or unaffected by PFAS. So I really feel that if we're going to do this and do this right, we need to get a statewide education campaign going. Um, so this will be a media blitz about um, residential drinking water wells, about inspecting your well, knowing what's in your area, what's knowing around your well, how to test your well, um, all the basics of, of that kind of information. So um, Kristen, I'm hoping to bring her in for a February meeting, March meeting, somewhere in there to give us some additional information on that campaign and because um, it should be kicking off in the new year. So, um, and then we are also looking at getting our um, PFAS GIS map updated with the compliance monitoring from the municipal drinking water systems around the state. That I'm, I've got a meeting set up for tomorrow to see how quickly we're going to get that, um, and hopefully some additional other layers put onto that map. So. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then we did get an update from um, EPA put out some guidance uh, Tuesday last week, um, talking about guidance for NPDES permits and pretreatment um, and monitoring programs. That is in regards to um, uh, a lot of the same work that we've already been doing, incorporating PFOS and PFOA into those discharge permits, into streams and rivers, making sure people are are um, not discharging above a water quality value. Um, e or, uh, EPA will be doing the same thing now for um, their uh, permits. And so we're looking at how EPA built their program kind of based off of ours to begin with. Um, they are looking at having additional analytes. Um, so right now we're looking at 28 analytes and they would be adding 40 to theirs. Um, but it's a it's a method 1633 which has not been completely validated yet. So uh, we're waiting to till that completely gets validated and we're ready to the labs are actually ready to um, implement that um, methodology for for analysis. So anyways, more to come on that, but um, I don't think that will 
make a huge difference to Michigan because we've already been doing everything that they're um, issuing guidance on. So, okay. And then, if that's not enough, um, on our MPART website, right on the main banner, right, Kelly? I think it's right on the main uh, banner, is our fast facts. So, um, we've put these out every year. We've um, had in the past, they've been two pages. This year, we thought it was better if we gave you some more information and really showed, highlighted some of those accomplishments. So we did, uh, it is eight pages this year, um, but it's pretty easy reading and you can uh, put your applause out for um, Kelly and Amy who put this all together and um, did all the layout and did it all themselves. We didn't go in for any kind of uh, mock layup. So yes. Um, and so there's a lot of really good information there that I think you guys again would uh, appreciate. So we can have, if it helps, we can have Kelly put that in the chat or send a link to that for you. Um, but I think I'd like you guys to take a look at that and see if you got any questions on that as well. So, um, and some of the interesting part, I don't know, Kelly, if you can go back to page two, where we talk about the different types of MPART sites that we've got. Um, yeah, so if you break up, um, the interesting part about these pie charts now is if you put them into uh, Excel spreadsheets and then put them into a pie chart, so um, the list on the right corresponds to the circle itself going clockwise, so landfills are blue and are the most numerous Industrial sites are the next color. Um, plating is the gray. Airports is the 19 with the um, orange. So you can work your way around that little diagram and see. Um, the reason we have so many landfill sites, obviously, is not just because they're landfills, but because we've uh, had an initiative to look at landfills um, with our in our materials management division has made a priority to um, prioritize those landfills that they think are high uh, probability of having or had already existing contamination and or had um, potential for drinking water impacts. So they've prioritized those landfills first. They've gotten through that whole first tier. They're now working into the middle tier of landfills. Um, and so out of the, you know, I don't remember how many they've actually looked at. They have about 70% of them did have PFAS above groundwater criteria um, in the in the groundwater existing. So they did become MPART sites. So that's why we have so many landfill sites. They're not necessarily the hottest or the highest concentrations, but um, they are numerous. It's not that that's too surprising to anybody on this one. Um, yeah, go ahead, Amy. Yeah, Kelly, if you can go back to the last page for a second. I, I think this is um, something mm -hmm. that we had an opportunity to do based on um, comments, I think, from at least one of the COG members. Um, so we actually have a, a needs thing at the very end. And one of the things we included was funding to support municipalities with contaminated site cleanup I, um, identified in the community. So yes. that is something that you know we had an opportunity to include this time. And um, we were able to keep in there and, and also you know funding to be more proactive um, and, and doing, you know, information and education. So we do have, you know, some needs listed in there. And, and that last one in particular, I mean, obviously we, we've all talked about the notification thing, so that's included in here too, but I uh, wanted to mention also the, the municipalities because that was a specific ask from one of the COG members. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great, thanks for bringing that up, Amy, because I think if you guys have opportunities um, and want to reach out to legislators or something like that. This document's a really good resource to say, hey, look at the, look at all the things that uh, MPART and Eagle and DHHS and all the other MPART agencies are working on um, as a, as a collaborative effort. They're getting we're getting a lot done with the resources we have, um, but there you know obviously there's still there's still more to be done. But yeah, good catch on that. Thanks, Amy. All right, any other questions for me? Is that my last slide there? Oh, not quite yet. Okay, Connie, did you have a question on that or did you yeah, wanna? Yeah, a real quick one, Abby. Um, mm -hmm. On the landfill issues, 
we see there's so many of them. Uh, what are you doing in the way of what is EGLE doing since you have been delegated the Clean Water Act authority? What is being done to make landfills pre-treat PFAS in their leachate before they discharge it into a pipe that goes to a wastewater treatment plant? Oh, um, I would say, you know, in a broad sense, they're doing everything that's required under not only under 115, but also under um, uh, Part 31. What they're okay, specifically one, doing? 115 doesn't do anything for PFAS and leachate. Right. Right. So it would it would regulate if there was a spill of leachate to the ground and that kind of stuff. So you're talking part 31. Um, that's a great question, Connie. And I don't know that I'm going to give you the best answer. So, um, Mike, Jerry, do you want to help out with that one? I do. So, Connie, Thank you. Uh, depending on which wastewater treatment plant it goes to, a wastewater treatment plant has what is known as an IPP or an industrial pretreatment program. And those wastewater treatment plants would set limits on that uh, discharge to them. So they are the first line in looking at that discharge. So uh, your large industrial wastewater treatment plants, municipal <laughs> and that have limits on what can be discharged to them so that they do not then discharge above the state limits for those waters. So actually the wastewater treatment plant through their IPP program is the one that is looking at those and determining if those are uh, discharges that they want to come to their plant. So some wastewater treatment plants have those companies actually treating their leachate before it goes to them. Uh, some leachate is trucked from landfills to a wastewater treatment plant. Once again, they have to have testing and other things done before that wastewater treatment plant will take that uh, leachate. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be working, Mike, at DWSD, Detroit Water and Sewage Treatment, because the PFAS concentrations coming out of the DWSD when they discharge it is higher than what's coming in. Ah, and that brings up a very interesting uh, science fact that wastewater treatment plants, what comes in isn't exactly always what goes out. Inside the wastewater treatment plant, there are reactions taking place that change long chain uh, PFAS that we currently can't measure using the techniques that we do using liquid chromatography change them into shorter change PFAS that we can measure. So we call that the PFAS dark matter. And so we do find that happening where what is coming in is not the same as what's going out. If you look at the different chemicals coming in, PFAS chemicals and what's going out, you'll see differences not only in what types, but the amounts of PFAS. So uh, those treatment processes within the wastewater treatment plant can change long chain PFAS into shorter chains. So things that we readily can measure, PFOA, PFOS, can be uh, come from those long chain ones that we currently don't have the ability to measure. Uh, one of the ways we look at that is to do a process called the top assay, total oxidizable precursors. And that is a way of looking at those where we do a test and we actually oxidize that uh, water with sodium hydroxide and potassium permanganate to look at what get happens. So uh, you're absolutely correct. What comes in may not be what's going out and you could have PFAS coming in lower than what's going out of the plant. I've seen it multiple times. There's multiple papers written about it. Hopefully okay, that thanks. helps you some. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, so it's it the first line of defense for the wastewater treatment plan is their IPP program. Remember, we the state uh, regulate what comes out of the plant itself out of their discharge. We don't regulate so much what's going in. The plant has that ability. They could actually tell someone, "You're not going to discharge to our plant anymore. You're done. That's it. Turn it off. Put the plug your pipe. We're done." 
So um, yeah, that's that could happen. Okay, thank you, Mike. I, I You're got welcome. A question, I got a question to for Abby. The last slide. Sure. So the the bottom part of that the deals with the knees. No, the the one and, before, I guess. Yeah. The, the the well when we heard the, what California has in terms of uh, consumer products uh, section having 40 staff going to 70 staff or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you you don't say what you need here. <laughs> well, yes. Um, you know, that would take a, an act of the legislature to enact a law and to give us the the uh, regulations to go with it. So um, it's something that I think, you know, if it gathered enough support, I bet you the legislature would would be all about it. Um, but it's not something we have a basis for here in Michigan right now. So, yeah. I, I like to keep my needs to tangible things that are can do the uh, immediate uh, band aid things that we need to get done. So, um, and as you guys have been talking about all night, we definitely need more staff to help us just do right. some of the basics. I mean, the, you're talking the, the ever increasing number of sites and then the, the more work to do, but, but then you're, you don't have a much. Uh, resources to focus on PFAS. You got to borrow uh, staff from all different sections and departments. Yep. Well, so the, it's, so it's both the, the what, beauty what, and the curse is we get to collaborate to make sure everybody is working on PFAS and incorporating it into their their already existing processes because ultimately. Um, in the grand scheme of things, PFAS is another contaminant of many, many contaminants we have in our environment. And so we want to make sure that PFAS is integrated into the normal processes of permitting and, and site cleanups and drinking water evaluations. All that needs to be integrated, which PFAS is getting there. It's very much is being integrated in a, into a lot of those processes. So we don't want to stand up just one unit for PFAS because PFAS needs to be incorporated in everything. However, you're right. I we could certainly use a couple more people to help us do some of the basics of, you know, keeping the information flowing, keeping the collaboration going, you know, being able to do that, reach out to the public, education, all those things. So, yeah, good point, John. Yeah, next version. <laughs> next year. <laughs> Expand it for those things. <laughs> Yes, yes, definitely. I think Mary yeah. and Teresa have their hands up. Maybe they're just exercising. This is Mary. Um, I, I would like to comment on what Abby was saying. Um, I think it goes back also, though, to Lynn's comment that if you don't ask, you don't always get either. And my my two takeaways from the PFAS summit, which I watched just about most of it. Um, oh, number one, some of those uh, more attended, I believe, uh, sections were demonstrating that the best response came when they were provided by polluter pay type situations like the Buick City uh, process and the Wisconsin, I think it was 1007 sites mm -hmm. that, you know, were able to be um, remediated because of their polluter pay uh, type thing where they had responsible parties. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing was, is like Joe was just talking about, um, you know, I would hate for Michigan, who was a leader in this, to fall behind other states because we don't have the funding. Uh, we, we certainly are proving that there is a large need here. Um, and, and Connie has spoken multiple times as well for uh, Wayne County, who may have the largest need 
for staff in their section, you know, region wise. So um, I, I think there are members of the COG that would be willing to start working on a process to uh, reach out to legislators, particularly brand new legislators. Thank you. And and I don't remember how many new legislators we have. It's a fairly good number, 50, 60 new legislators coming into the doors in January 1st. So absolutely, that's gonna be a great, I mean, it's just really going to be uh, necessary to to educate them, get them up to speed. You know, PFAS is not exactly um, a, you know, an easy subject to ditch, get, just get your hands around. So I think that that kind of outreach is going to be good on a, a multiple fronts, not only for them to get to know you, but also for them to be educated on what's going on in their communities around PFAS and then understanding the intricacies and, you um, you know, subtle subtleness of PFAS and what it means to communities. So I think it's a great idea, Mary. Um, so, you know, I've been trying to figure out how we do this within the uh, authority we've been given as a COG, which my understanding was from our guidelines was to give uh, feedback to MPART about uh, matters. But I do feel like this has been a repeated thing that we recognize and want to advocate that there's more funding for EGLE and MPART to address the PFAS issue. Um, and that is our feedback. So I'm thinking we probably need to get yet another subcommittee together to work on that. Uh, understanding that I still need subcommittee members for the uh, website review committee as well. So I, I'm not I, I don't want to start another subcommittee until we get the website review committee up to speed too, but give that some thought if people want to do that. I think there's some other NGOs. I know Great Lakes PFAS Action Network is going to be doing a lot of outreach to um, folks too, trying to get some funding and, and policy and changes in front of legislators. So um, that's a thing too. So I see Mary and Teresa's hands up again. Teresa, is your hand really up or are you, have you been waiting that patiently that long? Maybe not. Okay, Mary. Um, I, I would just like to say uh, to members that are not involved in the subcommittee at this point, um, the current subcommittees are staffed uh, by multiple people uh, or I'm sorry, uh, members that are on multiple subcommittees. So I realize that everybody has busy lives in that, but uh, in order for this COG to be successful, we do need other members to start uh, taking part in some of the subcommittee work. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I couldn't have said it better. All right, do you have anything else, Abby? Did you wanna go through new sites? Um, just a couple um, that are here and yeah, that were put up uh, this week. And so um, we've got two landfills and uh, uh, GM Pontiac North Campus that went up. Uh, nothing too exciting about those three. As I recall, they all had fairly low concentrations, but um, we've already done outreach and have already looked for um, Reswells and done any additional, um, any uh, residential drinking water sampling that was necessary at any of those. So not too much there. And then I think- One, the thing, last, one thing to note on here is GM Pontiac North Campus. That is an EPA led site. Thank you. Yeah. So they will be, they are in charge of the, um, the site itself. Um, as a state, we monitor it, but they're working with the uh, responsible party to do the work. So, but we're we're still monitoring those to make sure that they've looked at Reswells and that they're taking care of that part of it. Um, and then the next meeting is January 10th. So Kelly's working on invites right now. 
Okay, we have 11 minutes left. Any um, any suggestions for next month's meeting or anything else we need to put on um, on the agenda to discuss? Yes, Tally. One thing I just wanted to say, um, we had a couple members drop off, a couple members added. So when you guys send out new emails, if you can copy from the email that I just sent today with the meeting materials, that will be your new list. All members are up on the top. Um, so just so that we're not flooding people's inboxes that don't want the information. But maybe those people will miss us then and they will decide to come back or something. So, OK, Rick. Yeah, I had a uh, idea for the, the next meeting and there was a recent lawsuit that 3M won against the state of Michigan about applying uh, the MCLs to groundwater cleanups. And I think it'd be uh, good for our, our group to have somebody from the uh, AG's office potentially talk to us about how that might impact future site investigations and cleanups. Um, I'm sure that you know people are trying to figure out that that question themselves, but I, I I'm kind of concerned about uh, what that's going to do to uh, you know sites like the tannery and um, that have surface water impacts, and I, I just would like to know more about that. So, so thanks, Rick. Uh, Daniel can... is seconding that request. Do you guys have a way for somebody from the AG's office to attend their ask. January? To... Yeah, okay. I can ask and see. We've got one uh, specific uh, attorney general that's in charge of that case. Um, I can tell you though that the the judge stayed his own order, which means that the all of the drinking water values and the groundwater cleanup criteria for Part 201 are in effect and are enforceable, so we can still use them. Um, we did file a notice of intent to appeal, so that I don't know the date on that, but that will be going in sometime in January. So um, I will ask and um, see if I can get somebody here for the next meeting for from the AG's office. Great. All right. Anything else before we go? A whopping six minutes before eight o'clock. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, wait, Mary. Come on up. What you got? Sorry, just one more thing. Um, I had gone to a meeting um, recently and watched a presentation by Jeff Wright, who is the Water Resource Commissioner for Genesee County. And I did speak to him because his presentation had to deal partly with PFAS. And he said he would be willing to come on the COG and um, do his presentation. Um, if we were interested. Mm. All right. What, what, was the, what was the topic on Mary? He uh, was deal. He was um, part of it was dealing with PFAS and exactly what uh, Mike, Jury, and Connie were just talking about in the fact that uh, he can send out water that is primarily clean of PFAS, and then he will get back to the wastewater treatment plant water that is affected by PFAS because of products and that that people are using in their homes or that. So um, mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting uh, take and especially for people who are planning community meetings and that uh, that might be something that we want to address um, in getting that information out to the public on how to avoid PFAS at homes. Probably tougher than we think. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. I wrote those down. So uh, we will send out the agenda soon to the new COG members. Thank you to all the new members who sat through your first meeting. It's usually much more exciting than this and fun. Uh, <laughs> this is a good meeting. I'm glad we did it. So uh, everybody have a wonderful holiday season. Stay safe. Enjoy the cool weather and we'll see everybody in the new year. You as well. Merry All Christmas, right. everybody. Bye. Have a happy new year. Okay, bye-bye.
Bye.